Hey, how's it going, everybody? Nice to see you. Nice to see you here. Love all you. It is, that is right. It is time for Down to Earth with Christian Arloff. That's this show, Monday through Friday. We talk about the latest and greatest in the world of the UAP news. Um, if you're brand new to the channel, help us get to 25,000 subscribers. Let's do that first. I was I was reaching with 50. Let's try 25. Let's do that first. And if you like the long form stuff, well, I got a special surprise for you. But if you like the long form stuff, then check out the interview that we do with Avi Loeb. That is in our that's our main channel, the Christian Arloff channel, Big Thing Podcast. You can see that every Tuesday. But I do have a long form show that I'm going to drop here tomorrow on this channel, and that's going to be with Ashton Forbes talking about MH370, um, just the the footage in general, and talking to him about how he's convinced that this stuff is not fake. People say it's been debunked. He doesn't think so. So look for that tomorrow. Um, okay, so what, what's the deal? Well, if you clicked on this, you saw there's a lot going on with weaponized, with Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp. They're back, sort of. I think. And they had this episode that came out and they talked about a few different things of note. But if you clicked on this, then you probably clicked on it because we were talking about Jason Sands, right? The potential whistleblower. Who is this guy? Some people say, you know, this guy's legit. Other people go, no, he's not. He's got too many holes in his story. Well, Jeremy Corbell had this to say. So let's play this first. And then we'll talk about what he says here on the other side of it. Here it is. I did know about Jay Sands. You know, I've talked to him many times back in the day. It's not something I can personally report on because there's, you know, what is the difference between verifiable information and, and not verifiable information? You know, to my satisfaction, and I think to yours as well, that it is verified that Jay Sands worked in the positions that he says that he worked in that he was part of the intelligence community. Um, I'm not sure what has been said publicly, but you know, absolutely, he worked in the intelligence community and currently does. So the guy has security clearances and, and has worked in, in the capacities he said. In specifically, specifically, he worked as a red hat, which is like a counterintelligence at Area 51. He was intercepting communications. So this is a guy that would have heard the internal chatter from some of the most secretive programs that our, that our country has. And that is validated that that was his job. I can validate that for you. That is that is correct information. Um, I can also validate that he's testified to Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, to the Senate Armed Services Committee, and the and the um, House Armed Services Committee. So he did come forward with information. And I've talked to some people in those capacities, and they're like, "Yeah, with what we could verify, he did have some knowledge of." the um, legacy UFO programs. And I thought that was interesting because some of his other claims, you know, they're very hard to digest for the average person. He, he made some really astounding personal claims of encounters, none of which I could ever validate or verify. So for me, there's nothing I can do with them. You know, he could come forward with that story, but just like any other credible person can come forward with a story, a firsthand direct contact with a ET or non-human intelligence, there's just nothing much I can personally do with it. It wasn't a story that I felt I could run with. So it's a complex situation. I'm not sure what to make of it. How about you, George? Well, I, you know, you had told me about him, that you'd been having these conversations with him and you wanted to bring me in. That was I, more than a year ago. Maybe it's a year and a half or so. Yeah. And we finally had a real long, uh, detailed talk with him where he laid out his story for me as well as to you. And so I was able to ask him some questions. And so much of the key uh, incidents that he talked about were here in Nevada. Yeah. Um, so I, I know a lot about that base where he worked. And, you know, there were questions I could ask that gave me a sense of, did he really work there? And the answer is, yeah. yeah. Uh, I know that Jay has been, uh, well, Jason is how ever, I think everyone right. else uses the name, but Jay to us, um, that he has been dismayed in that he's really been ripped apart on UFO, Twitter and X and social media which happens to anybody who comes forward. That's, that's part of the, that's part of the whole shebang. Uh, he's upset. I think what I was told because people like you and I have not come forward to defend him. Well, you know, um, the agreement we had with him was that we're not going to talk about it. He yeah. shared his story with us with the understanding that we weren't going to go forward. We were not going to do an issue of weaponized uh, on his story. 
that he had already made agreements to keep buttoned down for a while. You know, there, and people don't know that there's tremendous competition for UFO whistleblowers and witnesses in the journalism world. The, the, the people who are considered credible who investigate this stuff, when they hear about a witness, they want to wrap them up. I want him to be my witness for my film or my book. And uh, there's a lot of competition there. So by the time you and I were getting into the nitty gritty with him, he'd already made some agreements about where his story was going to break. That's fine. It's fine with us. We weren't going to spill it. You know, I, I think that I'm not surprised that Jay's story is now out. I am surprised that it took this long to come out because I think he, you have the same feeling. He wanted to tell the world about his, what he had seen and what he had done. So, well, first of all, I, I will say that I think that it probably would have made more sense for Jason Sands to wait and do it on a weaponized show and wait to do it. If he could have done it with Jeremy Corbell and Knapp probably should have done that because I think one of the reasons he's getting, you know, pushback and stuff from the community is that myself included here on the, not pushback so much to say, because I don't know what to believe, but what I will tell you is that when you release your first report on Twitter space, I, it goes, you go like this. If David Grush would have done that, if David Grush, everything that David Grush said, he would have done that on a, a Twitter space or like a TikTok or something. You'd be like, what? You, what? But when you sit down with a reporter and you do it, now maybe he thought that people were dragging their feet and that nobody was going to talk to him. And maybe that's why he did what he did. I don't know. But the story is more so here. Look, I had um, I had uh, Jesse Michaels on my show about a week ago. And Jesse said the same thing where he had met him and talked to him. But Jesse had also said, but there's kind of a reason why I didn't want to, I didn't do a, sh a show on him. He didn't say he didn't believe him. He just said there was a reason why. And it seems similar to what Jeremy was saying there of just like, I don't know how to verify that stuff. I don't know how to, to verify that you were, you know, dancing with aliens, whatever. I didn't know he didn't say that, but whatever, whatever he might have said in general. Um, and I think that the verification from both uh, Jesse and Jeremy and George is that they say that this guy did work in this program. This isn't just some delusional guy. It seems like that's just saying, oh yeah, I, I worked there too. This seems like people are going, no, no, he actually is. He worked where he said he worked. Can't verify the other stuff because they're wild claims. And we still don't know where it stands with James Fox and how much and where James is going to land there. Uh, it, how much footage James is going to land inside of this documentary. So there's a lot that in, in that particular thing with Jason Sands, right? Is still will because of this whole thing, did it hurt help his cause? Are people going to take him serious? Can you verify it all? Do you want him as a witness? If you do another public hearing jury's still out, I, I want to stick with, cause I'm going to have Pavel in in a second, but I want to stick with the weaponized podcast because there is something else that I think that they addressed that I want to bring up. And I want to start with this. I follow the UFO Joe uh, and and Mike Colangelo. They're great aggregators of like a lot of the stuff that's going on in the uh, UAP world. And they break down stuff all the time. They're great follows. I would highly suggest it. And so Joe posts this one. He says, as a student, this is from the weaponized show, obviously, but as a student of propaganda, not a purveyor of it, I admire in a sense what Arrow did because it's effective. It worked. And Knapp has always said this. I've quoted Knapp with that he, I continue to quote Knapp with that they are better at their job than we are. And you know that he has, he has, it's like, you know, when you're playing a, a certain game, even though you wish you were better than that person at chess or whatever, you have to acknowledge that they're a better player. And this is where the video starts. And, and there's an actual continuation to actual video, but they don't have the video clip. Knapp says, lots of folks are down after the Kirkpatrick arrow crap. There are always peaks and valleys in this topic. We've been on a roll since 2017 and the New York Times article. It's mostly been a peak, but the dark empire striking back, it was bound to happen. This was a body blow and it's serious, but it's not the end. Don't give up. Taking a break and recharging the batteries is a good thing, to which Corbell says it's a marathon, not a sprint. Be patient, have a grit, and stick with it. Be methodical how you analyze stuff. The programs that are going to make people try to make people drop the subject are strong. You see that with how people who come forward are roasted. But I suspect, as always, there will be more coming. Now, there is a hell of a lot going on during this lull. Don't give up. Progress is being made, and not all of it obvious. 
Then they start to get into Kona Blue, which Corbell says Kona Blue was a proposed program. JC's friend Kirk says that Arrow Image is from the North Shore of Hawaii, where he lives. Kona Blue was a proposed sap to really go forward in studying the UFO phenomenon and related phenomena. Everything but the name is in your last book. And so then Knapp says, KB was a proposed program that would be the follow-up to AAWSAP. He goes into the background of it, which everybody can read about in SATP and Initial Revelations by Lakatsky, Keller, and Knapp. Reed tried to make AAWSAP a sap, but once word got out, it was killed. Bass had discussions between one or more aerospace companies where these companies were going to share some of their goodies. Bigelow retrofitted buildings to prepare them to receive the good stuff. He and his team were told that it's real and you're going to get some because we've had it for a long time and we can't figure it out. They never got the goodies. If the program had been allowed to continue, we might have had some answers by now. So this is where the clip begins, and I'm going to play just a little bit of it here. That pro plug was pulled. Dr. Lukatsky, Dr. Colum Kelleher, and others started looking for a new home. DIA was not opposed to allowing that to find someplace else, taken off our plate. If somebody else wants it, great. So they figured out that Department of Homeland Security, which is a relatively new organization back in that time frame, might be the place to go. So Code of Blue documents are now out. Uh, we'll talk about the reason I think it was released and made public by Arrow, but the documents are now out. But this is a program that we described in great detail in our book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. I mean, we, we explained how they were trying to sell it to DHS, what the response from DHS was, what they were going to do with that program. And then in that same book, there's an appendix in the back, Appendix 2, that outlines exactly what it was going to do. And if you compare note for note what's been now made publicly available about Kona Blue, this code name program, you see that they are one and the same. Now, we put that out in the book and people ignored it. You know, they just largely, yeah, mm, you know, yeah, that's really interesting. But I think because we did not have the name attached, they just kind of blew it off. Now that the name is attached, people are realizing, holy crap, that sounds a heck of a lot like that program that was described in this book. It is. It's the same thing. Right. We were not allowed to publish uh, the name Kona Blue. That was one of the things that Dopser would not allow to go forward. But they allowed us to tell the story about what that program would have been what it would have been because it never happened. In uh, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, I think it's chapter 17, Dr. Bukatsky, Keller, Hal Putoff went to DHS. They had a briefing with Dr. Tara O'Toole, brilliant scientist, uh, one of the head honchos there, head of a division within DHS. And it was supposed to be a briefing about what this program could be. And it was a limited time frame. She's a busy, busy person, of course. But it went on and on for hours. And after they finished the formal briefing, then they kind of closed their books and their notes and really told her what was going on. The experiences at the ranch, uh, the hitchhiker effect, they were blown away. Uh, she and her aides were blown away. And it was basically, look, we think this sounds really promising. Let's go. All right, Pavel, how's it going, my friend? Good, man. Thank you for having me. Of course, glad that you're here, and we got a lot to talk about here. This uh, reteaming, it seems, of Knapp and uh, Corbell, at least reteaming on the air because we haven't seen them for a little bit. So we'll start with the fact, you know, they've been they haven't put out a weaponized for a little bit. They do, and they obviously have to address this Jason th Sands thing, and they do. They address Jason Sands, and they they do what, as I mentioned in the report that I that I said up top here is. They pretty much confirm, like, look, yeah, this guy did work where he said he worked, but there's just too many wild claims that we can't verify. So it doesn't seem like anybody really has his back, but nobody's really calling him a liar. Does that make sense? Yeah, I would also take the route that uh, Nap said about the competition between right. different journalists and, right. and investigators, because that plays a huge role in all of this. Because uh, as I, I told you uh, between us, that uh, I can sense that there's this, this competition, you know, and there are mm -hmm. some people uh, from the upper echelons, if, if you can call it that, that are very jealous of the information they have and the sources they have. And yeah, I think that's what we're looking at right here. Like, uh, I think J uh, James Fox beat them all to the punch and... Many of them decided to not run with the story because James Fox had it. And also Sans, I see that he got a little bit desperate as the rest of us because we want information 
and he wanted his, his story out and he wasn't looking at any acceleration. So that's why I think he went reckless and decided to go through Twitter spaces without corroborating the wildest claims because nobody has said that uh, they corroborate uh, these claims. So it's it's a really interesting story and how they put it. It is, and I think it also ties in. I'm glad you brought up the frustration part because I think it ties into the second half there where it, it essentially starts with Corbell and Knapp saying, you know, don't get frustrated or, or stay the course. It's okay to be frustrated, but, you know, stay the course. Things are happening behind the scenes. Things are coming. And I don't, I don't feel that they are trying to give any misinformation, and that they, uh, and I don't feel like they are, you know, uh, not telling the truth that they are actually working on stuff. But you can't get excited in the way that you did in January or December when all these things were happening and this potential idea of this uh, document with Schumer was going to pass and the arrow thing hadn't come out yet and all this. And there seemed like there was more unity amongst people who were talking. And now, now it does seem you're in, as Knapp says, the, the dark empire has struck and it was a, it was a belly shot, as he said. So it's, it is, everybody is, is kind of reeling is, is there, I mean, cause Knapp's been playing the game for a long time. So he's seen the ups and downs and ebbs and flows of this thing. But the question is, is this one of the moments where it goes to sleep for a while and then it comes back up or is it just, no, it just kind of stays like here in the bottom for a little bit and then spikes back up. I mean, if we go uh, before 2017, I would tell you that uh, it hasn't happened. Like it, it's happening right now before ever. But also I would also tell you that, George Knapp uh, is writing these books with people who are very important in these programs. And in writing them and reaching that agreement, he also agreed to keep a lot of that information still secret and just disseminate it slowly. But I think that uh, in basic journalism, if you have a good story and it's a long story that needs to be disseminated over time, over years even, you mm -hmm. have to learn how to drop it little by little but the nuggets you drop have to be really substantial even if it's just the word or just the name of a program or you know and i yeah. think a lot of a lot of people in this space don't really understand that aspect of uh breaking news as as exactly you know and i think george Knapp does because he's, he's a legend he's a journalism legend and uh russ colhart too there's a lot of people in this space that don't get that and I think that's yeah, very important. Yeah, for sure it is. And I think that it it's why it was good to have those guys back though talking about it because yeah. they they that's one of the things I hope that they realize as well is that yes, even though they are working on things behind the scenes, like they are a big enough voice to where people are tuning into it to see what's going on and by them taking time off, I think whether it's a look and i know it's not easy trust me from experience i know it's not easy to do videos all the time to be in it all the time to be and i'm not just talking about this particular subject i'm just talking about in in, in life and doing the things and you, you get busy you're doing other things you're working on other things other priorities but having a family too <laughs> all that stuff but it's like yeah. one of the things though for them is that they are like when they're talking about stuff the news the headlines hit People are talking about it more. It comes back up. It stays in the zeitgeist when they're talking about it, especially because of NAP, what Jeremy Corbell has done. So it is important for them to keep talking. So I'm glad they are back talking because then it also shone a light a little bit more so on what you were talking about a few weeks ago. Let's talk about this before we go, the Kona Blue stuff, where you know it was covered in NAP's book. It was a different name in the book itself but now he's like yeah that's we, we've talked about this and i thought it was interesting where he's like we we brought this thing up we brought it up a while ago and it was like oh yeah whatever that is who knows and because it was official then everybody took it serious and that's not unlike what we talk about on this show all the time that if people are talking about certain like look at it perfect example and this is not to pat ourselves on the back three or four weeks ago we covered that new york story of uh, the the UFO that was seen from Florida to New York, we covered it on this channel, right? And we said, well, what's that? Who knows? We had the conversation. We talked about it. But nobody really picked it up, and that's fine. We're a smaller channel. We totally understand that. 
and then News Nation covers it, and then it starts to go everywhere. And that is why it is so important for these bigger outlets to cover these things. Now, imagine, imagine now that if CNN and Fox and MSNBC, they all covered it too. A lot more yeah. people would be talking about it. And so Knapp's point of, okay, we talk about it on our thing, and nobody takes this thing seriously. It's us speculating again. But now there's this official program. So break this down to me a little bit. What's the significance of all this? I think that uh, basically what Nap was talking about is that uh, Sean Kirkpatrick managed to get the name to use for usage, but he used it in his own benefit and against all the people that reported on it initially, which was George Knapp and Lakatsky and, and all the people involved uh, uh, who whistleblowed. And that's the point that I think uh, George Knapp was trying to make. And I think it's very important because, uh, yeah, the program never lifted up the ground. But it, if somebody else would have released those documents with a different light uh, to what Kirkpatrick did, it would have been a very different um, reaction from the people. Because instantly when we knew that Arrow released it, what was the first thought in our heads? What's this? It's, yeah. And because we already have a bias against them because they haven't right. done things transparently. So that's the point I think it's important to take from this, uh, from Nap. Did so that's and that's what Nap said as far as why they released it. Yeah. yeah. He, that he, uh, that Kirkpatrick weaponized the name and mm. the release, the time release of the information because you got to keep in mind these documents were declassified about two or right. three days after Grush's uh, testimony in Congress. Yeah. So, why didn't they declare? De why didn't they didn't they release them then? Well, there's a lot, a lot out there, man. There's a lot to cover overall, and we'll be covering it here every day, at least Monday through Friday. So, Pavel, thanks for joining us again here today, man. Thank you for having me. All right. So there was a lot there that we broke down as far as the conversation between Knapp and Corbell. What do you think about the Jason Sand stuff? What do you think about the Kona Blue stuff? What do you think about? you know, where we are right now with the information and we are indeed in a place of, I don't know, man, I don't really think anything's going to happen or no, 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 hold, hold, hold. Things are about to change. Where do you stand on it? Very curious to hear your thoughts. Put your comments in there. Let me know again, if you haven't already done it, subscribe to the channel, trying to get to 25,000 tomorrow on this channel. Ashton Forbes will be on the channel with myself and Mark Riley. If you haven't seen the Avi Loeb interview, make sure you do that. If you listen to us on podcast feed, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, just get the Down to Earth podcast feed and you'll get all that stuff. If you want to watch the Avi Loeb, you go to the main channel. You want to watch Ashton Forbes, you stay here, you subscribe. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to Pavel, and we'll see you later. Thanks.